Hi, everybody. I'm Caitlin Mormon. I'm the head of data and business operations at Trove and one of the locally optimistic admins. And we also have Michael here. Give a wave. Another one of our admins. And I'm really excited to have Claire Carroll joining us today to talk about how and why to write about your work. So I'm going to hand it over to her in a moment to introduce herself, but just in terms of housekeeping details, we're going to use Slack instead of the Zoom chat if you have questions or comments. So come join us in meet up right about your work on the locally optimistic Slack. And if you have a question that you want me to ask Claire, drop it in there with a big red question mark at the beginning so I can definitely see it. And otherwise feel free to bring your banter and your side chatter and whatever else you wanna slack about in there as well. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Claire to introduce herself. Cool. Okay, hi everyone. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces today and some new faces as well, but familiar names. Um, so it's a, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, I'm Claire, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm based in Burlington, Vermont, so uh, northeast of the US, almost as close as you can get to Canada before crossing the border. Um, and yeah, I actually haven't been on a locally optimistic event before and was sort of king, I was like, I, I would like to, I think it would be fun and we're kicking around ideas. And um, this is what we landed on, how to write about your work. Um, I felt passionate about talking about this topic because I think it is a really, really valuable skill. Um, it's one that I got to really hone in my last role. So a very quick introduction to who, like, you know, what I used to do um, and how that intersected with this topic. Um, my previous role, I was the community manager at DBT Labs, um, formerly known as Fishtown Analytics. And in that role, I did a ton of writing. Uh, I did a lot of writing on Slack and some people's questions. Um, I wrote a lot of the technical documentation um in sort of like the brand voice i wrote um a lot of the of like a lot of opinion pieces marketing pieces um, i spoke at events uh all these kind of different ways of, of writing or communicating about your work um and finally i also got to act as an editor on other people's work so i got a little bit of a bird's eye view in terms of how other people are writing about their work and sort of the common mistakes um that i'd see i think we're going to touch on that a little bit later today um, one thing that I kind of teased at on Twitter and uh, I'll echo it back here though, is I was not always a good writer. Um, I actually studied engineering because I wanted to do math and science and I didn't want to do any of these, you know, English based subjects. And they make you do an engineering communication course in first year engineering. And I scraped a D minus um, in that course. Um, and so I wasn't very good, like that was 10 years ago, but it, this is a skill that I've had to you know, really, really practice a lot. Um, but I think that, you know, that means that I may not be the best writer in this room, but it does mean that hopefully there's a few things that I've learned along the way that if you're someone that's looking to improve your writing, because you know, I've sort of gone from there and gone in a general upwards direction, um, hopefully there's a few things that I can share today. Awesome. So why don't we start there with that general trajectory, which seems like a relatively steep one. Um, and how you went from a D minus in, yeah. in technical writing to yeah. not just kind of doing this as part of your job, but actually doing it voluntarily as well for yourself. Oh yeah, I should say I also write on my own blog post, my own blog now as well. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, at first, when I sort of did that subject, first of all, I also think that subject was one of those subjects that was outdated, like they were testing the wrong things, in my opinion, my, my defense a little bit. Um, but I also like, it was sort of both. I wasn't a great technical writer, and they were testing this way of technical writing that was very, very formal. Um, and when I first left college, I probably didn't get much better then. And it wasn't until I actually got exposed to really good writing in my first startup job, which was um, a small startup called Uber. Um, and they had a huge email culture that like actually I started to see how impactful, really well-written communication was. A lot of like TLDR, like the first time I ever saw that and like who's on BCC and who's on CC. And um, I think it was because they were using HipChat at the time and HipChat was so awful that we just defaulted to um, email communication. 
very much uh, communication that had to, you know, be sent worldwide as well, which I think is a, something that we are sort of dealing with more this year than any other year. Um, sort of, you know, a lot of asynchronous work crossing over different time zones. And I think I started to like hone one very small skill, which was how to write a good bug simply because if I wrote a bug from the Sydney office, but the San Francisco office was looking at when I was asleep, it wasn't going to get addressed unless I wrote that bug report extremely, extremely clearly. So there was this just like really good feedback loop that was almost like no feedback. You know, if you haven't done a good enough job, we're not going to reply to this. We're just going to say, please be clearer. And then another day goes by until you get a response and another day and another day. So it was sort of in that first job and ex like exposure to really well-written communication, um, but also sort of lining the hard way and not doing a good enough job the first few times where I, I started to build a little bit of those um, technical writing skills. Um, I did write notes for myself every once. <laughs> I'm just checking if there's anything else I want to touch on. Um, oh yeah. So through that, like I started to become like a ruthless self-editor, um, maybe too much. Like I just will edit myself a lot, a lot, a lot and do a lot of iterations of things that I was writing there. Um, and then a couple of years later, when I started to inhabit like more of the role of the data analyst, that was when I started to write like some of these more technical articles. Um, if you look hard enough, you'll find some discourse posts on like the Looker discourse, um, which I think I would cringe at today. Um, but just sort of, you know, whenever I did something that I was like, this is cool. I want other people, to, like hopefully other people find this valuable, but it was also a little bit of like, I want to show off this thing. Um, I went ahead and started writing it. And yeah, I think some of those old posts are probably terrible, but um, you know, practice doesn't always make perfect, but practice gets you better. So just a lot, a lot of practice between then and, and where I got to now. Um, the then like in my last role, the thing that you know was so helpful, and I think that was the big step change for me in my writing, um, was that I got to work with an editor. Like I had people on the team who were better writers than me, who could give me really clear feedback, who um, you know knew the subject matter that I was you know writing about. That can be really hard when you work at a startup and you want to write an engineering blog and someone from marketing reviews it and they don't know these data things. Um, and I was really lucky where like the CEO of the company was a former marketer and a fantastic writer. Uh, and we soon had a like head of marketing come in who also acted as a, a really great editor. Um, so some of like you know, having a great editor, obviously that's not available to everyone. Um, I also like wrote, so I also read a lot. I read, you know, the data science roundup and I would uh, bookmark the articles I loved and then try and go back and reverse engineer like what are the things that I love about this um, I you know read a couple of books and I'll, I'll put links um, in the slack in just a moment if I get to it um, like sense of style by Stephen Pinker I think it was it was one of them and the other one is like an engineering communication went back to like <laughs> the original subject tried to make it better um, and those books helped formalize things that I'd started to internalize that like, you know, like I'd started to realize like, oh, I like it when the headings are really clear. And then that book was like, make sure your headings are really clear. And I'm like, oh, I'm on the right, right path there. So tons of different things all at once. Um, it is hard to isolate which one of those things was, was the biggest help, but a lot at once. So to get a little more specific on that, as you look back at your sort of older work, where are the parts of your writing where you've seen the biggest change in how you write and the biggest growth? Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of my early writing was from the voice of someone trying to show off what they'd done and like being a little arrogant about it. And I think I've tried to really sway the other way of like being empathetic and understanding, you know, someone else might not get this on the first go. Um, and, you know, not that like I'm smarter than you for like knowing this thing that you don't know, but instead like this is a gift and I'm really excited to give it to you. That sort of, I think when I look back at some of the stuff that I cringe at is, is the biggest change is where I have was writing for, uh, you know, the sake of showing off instead of teaching, I guess. 
it's funny to even think of that. I haven't read any of your early writing, but I think of you as such I'll, like, a, I'll, I'll find some. <laughs> an empathetic writer who really kind of breaks it down and, and understands where people are coming from. So um, well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, a question from Josh that's somewhat related to this. Um, do you have any tips on reverse engineering writing that you like and looking at something from someone you really respect their style and getting yourself closer to that. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, I kind of mentioned that I re would reverse engineer articles that I liked, but I also towards like when I got more comfortable with that would start reverse engineering things that I didn't like or editing articles that didn't make sense to me. Um, just as like, yeah, and sometimes these would go nowhere. Like I would just read something and be like, oh, this could have been better. Um, and would try to isolate like why isn't this clicking for me um other than that though in terms of like reverse engineering things um I think oh, I have a wait, let me find this link du, 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 du. um I wrote a link of, of some things there we go so I I wrote about speaking at a meetup but speaking at a meetup is actually kind of similar to writing about your work and there's some things in there that are kind of relevant um I started to learn like I connected to material more when there was a narrative structure to it when there was a personal anecdote at the start when there was you know a screenshot from Slack that made me feel really empathetic to the person's situation when um someone used full sentences as headings because I have really short attention span and so if like the sentence the like heading as a sentence reorients where I'm at I found that really useful compared to like a one word, you know, introduction, uh, data modeling, or, you know, I don't know what we're writing about. Um, but just all these little things that um, I started to pick up on and would just jot down every time that I saw it. And then when I saw someone not doing that, I'd realize like, hey, this could actually be better if we change this sentence around just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go a little bigger picture, but how do you think about kind of the value you get out of writing about your work and maybe more specifically, Michael dropped in the chat, how has writing helped or hurt your professional career? Oh, gosh. Um, well, don't tweet when you're angry. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I mean, that's true. But anyway, um, how do I think about the value that I get? out of writing is that is that the first part of the question mm -hmm. yeah which may or so, may not be professional is, is kind of my point maybe, maybe you'll cover yeah. this maybe maybe you've got a bigger picture view yeah so I mean I guess like I was kind of lucky in that it was part of my role in like my last job like if I was writing things I was I was doing my work um but that's not the case for a lot of people who you kind of have to carve out the time to write or it's a thing that you're doing on the weekend or after work like it's an, an extra thing to do there um and so I think like the value for me is I'm often trying to create value for whoever I was like two, three years ago when I've like mastered a skill and I want the next person to know how much easier like their way of doing something can be if they just, uh, you know, do it this different way. And that's like, for me, a lot of the value in sort of the more technical writing. And then I guess in some of the bigger picture things, it's, a, a way to almost like distill my own thoughts on something so sometimes I write something and like I've done this so many times where I think I have a really strong opinion um I did this recently when I was like trying to write a thing about whether Kimball is relevant and I started at one really strong opinion and then over time it like kept moving away from where I started at and so it's like to synthesize my own stance and that article like ends up not being that great and so I'm not going to publish it but it was a valuable tool for me to, you know, uh, push my own understanding of a topic to um, make sure like, yeah, to, to push my own understanding of a topic, but to also um, just, yeah, keep, keep trying to create things that are valuable to other people. Um, in terms of how it's helped or hurt my career, I guess, uh, so far it has, it's only been really helpful. Um, I, I write a little bit on my own blog and usually those are things that um, 
they're things that I see people, you know, like questions that I get asked a lot uh, from my previous role. Like if someone's asked you the same question three or four times, then try and turn it into an article. Um, and so, yeah, so far it has only, only helped my career, I think. Unless, Michael, you're thinking about a specific thing that I wrote that <laughs> no, ruined I, me I, and I don't know about it. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just curious, like, to get your perspective on it. That was great. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions kind of around the theme of getting started writing. Mm -hmm. And so I'll start yeah. with kind of the very general question. How would you recommend that somebody get started writing? Um, just start. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like you just have to start somewhere. Um, write on the easiest platform possible. Like I know Medium's not cool, but it's so easy. <laughs> like just use Medium. Don't let like don't let building your own Jekyll website be a blocker to getting your blog out there. I have my own Jekyll website because I wanted to learn how to build a website, and so that's why I did that. But I would not recommend it to other people. Um, I think I mentioned this very briefly before, but you know, if you're stuck for what to write on, like what's the topic, it is like the most useful prompts that we've found is, you know, what are the things that you wish you knew two years ago that you, you really know now? And what are the things that someone's asked you two or three times in the past six months that you've found yourself explaining on a call? And, you know, now you sort of want to go and write that down. And um, so you don't find yourself explaining it again and again. Um, so those are two prompts that I've used with people in the past to get them just into that first topic. Um, I find it easier to start with technical writing, uh, little projects um, that I've worked on uh, and sort of, you know, rather than trying to go for big thought pieces, like uh, when the data industry is doing a lot of navel gazing at the moment and I'm like not, not getting involved in that because that's not the space that I, I love to write in. I love to write in like uh, content that's really, actionable and practical to people today so um and I, I love reading that content but I will be very very clear so don't be intimidated by the level of discourse that's happening out there um even if you think that someone's written this version of an answer before like I don't know how the google algorithm works maybe your answer will be the one that becomes you know SEO'd the most um who knows um but even in smaller ways even like outside of uh, writing, writing full blog pieces, you know, like answering questions on Whistle of Domestic Slack, answering a question on, on DBT Slack, answering a Stack Overflow post. So those are different kinds of, of writing. Um, making sure that you write that email really to your coworkers really clearly. Um, just finding those opportunities because like, yeah, writing about your work is not just, you know, writing a, a blog post or a, um, a Substack newsletter. It is it's everywhere. It's like all the places that you're you know, putting your fingers on the keyboard. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. There's so much value in just improving the writing that you do every day and taking the opportunity to your point to, to think through a problem more holistically. And this is really closely related, I think, to a thread that has been going in locally optimistic the last couple of days about people who are unwilling to kind of voice their opinions. Sometimes that's because like they don't want to speak up or they're more introverted. Yeah. And writing is a really great way to go through that process of like, do I really believe in this? Yeah. <laughs> and how do I want to communicate it? And, you know, kind of focusing on just that day to day is super valuable. Do you have any specific advice for someone who is worried their current writing isn't good enough to share? Um, share it anyway. <laughs> and like find someone who's uh, you know, maybe there's someone on your team, maybe there's someone, um, I, I think Locally Optimistic has a, a tech writing channel. If not, you should create one. Um, there's definitely one on the DBT Slack. Um, you know, there's, I, I think there's probably someone in, in the community, if there's not someone in your immediate workplace that is willing to give you feedback on, on your writing, but uh, it's hard to give feedback on something that doesn't exist. So you have to have to write it anyway, even if, uh, if you don't feel like it's at the right level yet. Yeah, I think that's a great call out. We don't have a dedicated channel in Locally Optimistic, but I, I think that we should. <laughs> and there are definitely- I don't have that power of it. You do have that power. Everyone has that power. Everyone has that power. Yeah, maybe we'll change this channel into uh, 
into that channel later. Yeah, I think that's a great call. Um, but I know there are lots of people in the community who would be happy to help. And then one more closely related question, do you have any advice for someone who wants to write more, but generally doesn't enjoy writing or thinks of it <laughs> as a chore? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I really love uh, sometimes recording myself. <laughs> I guess I love the sound of my own voice. That sounds terrible to say. Um, but sometimes I find that an easy way to get over that initial like hurdle of I have so many thoughts and I don't don't know where to start and there's really good apps for I mean the notes app just transcribes pretty well these days so thinking about things like that like can I get over that initial hurdle by just uh you know putting things in a notes app with a, a voice recording and getting it to transcribe um I'm a pen and paper person uh to start off with like this was wait these are my notes I'm writing about your work this might become a blog post in the end um but that's where I start usually. I start with notes in a notebook and lots of arrows where I got things in the wrong order. Um, I then usually move to a Google Doc and there's no, like, that. I've never written a blog post perfectly the first time that I wrote it. Like there's so much editing between when you start something and when you uh, show, like when you share the final thing, it is not a linear process. Um, I can talk a little bit more about what my process normally looks like. But yeah, I think if it feels like a chore, um, trying to find some entry point that feels less chore-like, but then everyone hits that wall, you know? Like you wrote a post, you know it's not right. You don't know what to do next. I walk away from it. You'll come back. Like your mind will continue to work on it in the background, I find. And then you look at it and you either realize like, this was really bad and I need to fix it. Or you look at it again and you're like, eh, not that bad. Like I actually just have a few things to change and. Uh, yeah, so if you get to that like writer's block on things, just walk away from it. Yeah, yeah that, that but... moment to look back is really helpful. Uh, it really unblocks a lot of things. Um, next question from the audience. I'm like mm -hmm. basically not even using anything I prepped because okay. you guys are amazing <laughs> and you're just okay. feeding me all the questions. It's beautiful. Uh, but how do you prioritize the quality versus quantity of your writing and which yeah. do you think of as more important? Mm. Earlier on, I definitely prioritized quantity. Um, like I kind of just, you know, I, I saw someone say something recently. I, I don't know if this is true, but I like the analogy if it's not true. Um, that like there was two classes of potters and one was told to go for quality and one was told to go for quantity. And the class that was told to go for like, you know, quantity of bowls or whatever ended up making better quality bowls as well. And it was like, I hope that's a true study because it's, it's a nice analogy. Like when you need to improve quickly, quantity is going to get you they're faster than trying to make fewer really good things. Um, I'm now at a point where uh, I'm going to go for quality over quantity. Like I kind of have a you know somewhat of a brand attached to my writing, and so I want to make sure the things I put out there are are pretty good. Um, and so I don't write all the time. And I wrote like a small thing the other day, and I was like, ah, this was an easy thing to write, but it wasn't that good, and maybe I'll take it down later. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think there's like an inflection in someone's, you know, career and their seniority where they, where, um, me personally, like I, I start to think more about quality over quantity. Um, there's tons of experienced people on the call though. Like I, I know Michael, you said before, like if this, if the mood to write strikes you, like just go for it. And so that to me indicates maybe it's like a bit more of a, a quantity thing. So I think everyone on the call is probably going to have a different, uh, answer there based on, on what they yeah, what I think. Yeah, when did you reach that turning point of feeling like you had a brand that you wanted to think about and kind of protect more based yeah. on that quality? <laughs> um, honestly, it was when I went to Look a Join a couple of years ago and people like were like, yo, Claire from DBT. And I was like, am I? And that was when I realized like, oh, like even, even if an article only gets, you know, 12 likes on DBT discourse, it has, tens of thousands of views <laughs> and that was the, the point at which I was like okay yeah like that was a bit of a turning point for, for considering sort of the the brand I was putting out there 
I'll, can I can I quickly jump in to comment yeah. on the, the quantity versus quality? So I do believe that it's important. Like I think quantity is really important to develop your skills as a writer, but you don't have to publish everything that you write. I write. Yeah. People think that I publish a lot, but like I write way, 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 way more than anything that the public is. Way like by a lot. Um, I write in my diary every day, every day. I write very long emails to friends about random topics or things that I'm thinking about, you know, multiple hundreds, thousands of words in emails that are things that I'm thinking about. And that quantity really helps me flex the muscle of writing and developing my perspective as Claire was talking about. And then also just like getting better at communicating clearly. And so when it comes to things that I do wanna to publish to a broader audience, like I'm generally selecting from ideas that I've already worked out, writing them down in other formats. So I think that like that's, like quality is very important if you want to, like, especially once you have a bigger brand and you wanna like, you know, make sure that people come to trust you as a source and they come to expect like high quality writing from you. But I, but like, I personally write so much more than what eventually gets published. And I think Claire, like you sort of alluded to doing that as well. But so that's how I yeah. think about the, that balance. Yeah, that's really, really useful. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great call out. And also I, I would encourage people to think of kind of the way that this compounds over time, sort of like you're building your, view of the world and at first it you know you kind of need to build quickly <laughs> to feel like you're making progress and then over time you realize like oh people are still reading michael's analytics engineering blog post constantly like this is years yeah. old but it, it still is adding a lot of value to the world and so it's less about the incremental value you add with each blog post and more about how you kind of think of the holistic value that you've created that i think can be really powerful um, awesome. So there are a few questions that are closely related here around, uh, process. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll start with Will's question, which is a good overview. What is your overall process for content development look like? Um, where do yeah. you start once you've got a, a topic or an idea, or does it start somewhere before that? <laughs> yeah. Um, it starts when the head of marketing says you need to write an article on this. No, I'm just kidding. Like <laughs> that, that leads to the worst article. It starts with an idea. And, um, that's, as I said before, usually that's because I'm, you know, no, like I, there's something I want to teach the person from a, myself from a few years ago. There's something that I'm being asked a lot of times, um, or there's like things happening in the community in the current, you know, data zeitgeist that you want to weigh in on. Um, and so assuming you have an idea, what is, what does my process actually look like? Um, so first of all, I just write everything down and whether that's my notebook, whether that's a Google doc, it is a brain dump. It is half finished sentences. It is, you know, like I'll have my cursor like here on the page and then suddenly I'll be like, oh, don't forget to write about that. And I'll jump up there. And when I look back at the paragraph I was halfway writing through, I was like, I don't know what on earth I was writing. Um, but it is just like, total brain dump mode everything that I, I have to say on a topic and one thing that I've learned with my own tendencies is that I have too much to say on topics and it it benefits my writing to have fewer things to say on a topic so the first thing is getting it all out there that's sort of like my brain dump phase um that no one should be looking at, at that for me like when I do that that's not where where I get shared um the next stage that I go through is like shaping if you're familiar with uh you know shape up um base camp they, they have some good ideas they also have some not so good ideas um but shape up was is sort of the design equivalent of this um so i take my brain dump and i sort of reorganize it into a flow that makes sense um i try to infuse a narrative um i try to make sure the ideas build on each other um usually the artifact of that work is uh you know like headings that describe the paragraph sometimes they might just be dot points sometimes it's like i'm going to put a diagram in here i'm going to put like an example in here um and some of the paragraphs will be fully formed the ones that are like harder to uh you know, the ones that i think like people won't immediately know what i i want to say here but the ones where i'm like no i can write this paragraph easily i'll sort of um just leave that as a dot point and just say like here i'm going to run through the four different marketing attribution types like, I don't need to write that out at this point in time. Just trying to get that structure. Um, 
And for me, this was actually a huge turning point for my own writing was when I became comfortable sharing that with like whoever was acting as my editor. Um, someone that, something that I got to see when I was editing other people's work was like, I was getting what they considered the finished product. And sometimes it wasn't right. Like it just, there was something that was structurally not good about it. And it's actually really hard, like emotionally to give feedback to someone who's already invested a ton of time in a piece. And so if you are lucky enough to have an editor, as soon as you have that like shaped document that's just dot points and sort of in the right order, try and share it at that point to say like, is the scope of this document like directionally correct? Is this, is this a thing that, you know, you want on your blog? Is the thing that, uh, you know, it's, is worth sharing? I think like that was a, a thing that I had to learn and I've had to teach a lot of people is getting comfortable sharing your work earlier. And it's at that point that I try to share it. Um, also at that point, I try to, um, at the top of the page, I'll write who the audience, the target audience is and who and what the purpose of the document is. And those things won't go in the final document, but they become really, really useful for like checking my own work. Um, I find it really confusing. I read a book recently about like open source software where in one chapter, the author explained like what Git was. And then in the next chapter, talked about DevOps as though everyone knew what it was. And I was like, I, I know what both these things are. I'm fine. Like I can read through this, but it was disorienting to me that the target audience had changed. So sometimes just writing it out really clearly at the top of the document can be a great way to like self-check your own work. Um, also in this shaping process, that's where I'll remove content. That's where I'll go like, I have too much to say on this. Maybe this is a secondary article. Maybe this is a footnote. Maybe this is like a link to a Git repo that demonstrates this whole thing. Um, but yeah, the important thing for me, like if you have someone to give feedback, this is where I would be sharing this. Um, the third phase for me is actually copywriting, going in, finishing paragraphs um, and getting you know, copy edits on that. Uh, what's really useful here is learning your own tendencies. I know I use too many exclamation marks and italics. I know that <laughs> like, uh, everyone tells me that. I'm already cutting it down by half everyone, just so you know, like by the time you see a post, I've already deleted half the exclamation marks. Um, the classic advice of trying to use fewer words. There's tools like, oh, someone's gonna know the name of it. Um, is it the Hemingway editor? Yeah, I'm getting some nods, things like that. that that like those things can pass the copywriting can pass but you can still have a not great article because the structure was wrong and so that's why I emphasize getting feedback at the structural um, stage of things and then finishing off the copy um, so yeah that, that's sort of my process in terms of tooling um, Barry's on the call we have a big joke about how we both write posts which is like we start in Google Docs because it's really easy to collaborate and have suggested edits and comments in Google Docs, but then we all like both of us, I think copy and paste it into Notion because the formatting gets preserved when you copy and paste from Google Docs to Notion. And once it's in Notion, you can export it as Markdown. And once it's in Markdown, the world is your oyster. You can ghost medium, like, you know, a Jekyll website, anything like Markdown is, uh, is kind of the, the end goal there. So um, it's a terrible workflow. Uh, Barry's going to build me an app to solve it. Um, but it's, <laughs> It's the workflow that we both use. Um, Will, did you want to ask any questions there? I can see you on the call. No, I'm, I'm just making sure I got the entire little flow there. <laughs> if, I, if only someone has had the shaped notes ready to go, yeah, I'll share them later. <laughs> um, maybe related to that, you referred early in the call into your to your tendency to over self edit and sort of focus too much on that. Yeah. How do you throughout that process clamp down on that urge to self edit yeah. or not put it out there, or not consider it not ready? Yeah, I think that's it's about knowing when that's useful, right? Like um, when I was not great at writing self-editing was a really useful tool but at some point it becomes you know editing to make something 10 percent better but I've spent 80 percent of my time revising one sentence like there's a, a trade-off um so in terms of how to clamp down on that tendency I think it's 
uh, I, I don't know if I want to like promote people away from self-editing, but more about like just knowing when to edit and when it's valuable. And I guess maybe looking back, like once you've written a post and thinking about how much time went into this and, you know, was that time valuable and just building your own tolerance around where should I stop with something from that, if that makes sense. So, yeah, like I encourage self-editing, but there's definitely a diminishing returns. And I think the only way to learn diminishing, the point of diminishing returns is uh, through, ref the, through reflection. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, it's a learned skill for sure. Um, so once it's out in the world, here's another question from Will. Uh, how do you handle criticism or disagreements of the ideas you're putting forth? Not so much um, from an emotional yeah. perspective, but how do you re-engage with the topic once you've put it out there and put, drawn your line in the sand? Um, I just get every single idea correct on the first go. Um, so I never get, criticize them. I'm just I I can't be, can tell that I'm joking um I don't know Will is there something that I've written that that springs to mind I'm trying to put myself in this um no not at all I mean, yeah we're on slack threads all the time and yeah usually we're all we all pretty much are on the yeah. same okay so I mean I think there's one there's one post that I wrote on my own blog about team key results and that was very much my my take on uh okrs is that i had to learn to play the game so that i could then say this game is kind of silly isn't it um but me writing the post was me learning to play the game and i think if i now that i've a few months on from that um if i were to rewrite that post i'd have a bit more of a skeptic's eye on it and so i do have it to do to go back and try and figure out like what is the right answer here because I, I did the thing I followed the process I learned how to do this skill and I want other people to know how to do this skill so that they you know if they're asked to write chaos for your team they know how to do it but I've also become somewhat skeptical about you know the value of that whole thing so it's kind of like yeah I just had to learn to play the game um and so I, I didn't get an opportunity to well no, I do have an opportunity to to re-engage with that but I, I just haven't yet um, but I think there is just like a, hum like a humility aspect, being able to say like, I thought this was right at the time. Turns out I like, I'm willing to update my opinions on this thing. Um, so yeah, just stay, stay humble, stay uh, open to other people's perspectives. Um, and I guess like don't take it too personally as well. That's my only other advice. Like it's, this is work stuff. This is not, uh, not your whole well-being so if it turns out that you got a thing about key results wrong like it's okay I'm still a decent person so, um yeah I don't know I, is, was there anyone else that wanted to weigh in there I feel like I don't necessarily have a strong answer there Michael you're prone to hot takes and you just unmuted yourself for a second so I'm, I'm interested I'm not, I mean I'm not, I'm not sure that I have like an interesting answer here I mean you know people Sometimes people criticize things that I've written. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes I don't think they are, but like, I think this is another thing that comes with writing more is like, you just get used to it. It's like, some yeah. people like some of the things that I've written a lot, they disagree with others. And like, that's fine. You know, it's again, it's like, once you're in the habit of doing this a fair amount is just every, any individual criticism matters a lot less because ideally like it's also sort of drowned out by a lot of other people who, you know, for whom you, whatever Probably. you're writing resonated with them or was helpful. And so, yeah, I, you know, I don't, I think it's always good when you get criticism to like take a breath and like think about it in any context and like definitely with writing, uh, that's also important. But I think, you know, if you're not, if you're not intentionally writing something that's very inflammatory or that's like calling someone yeah. out personally for something, like, I don't think that you're going to get the sort of feedback that's, causes super emotional uh turmoil um yeah but is your question more about like on the draft stage or is that more on like the final stage people don't agree with your ideas more like if i put something out there and somebody else has a very good point that actually changes my mind yeah like how do i re-engage with that in a timely manner where you know it's not two years ago i published this and just now i'm getting back to it but like 
I've actually updated my opinion and I want to include that and like re-communicate that. Oh, that's a great question. I mean, what I would do is I go back and I will either like delete the old blog post or <laughs> I'll like add an update to, or I'll like delete the part that was wrong and add an update or I'll write a whole other blog post about that, going through that process. Like, here's what I learned, you know, here's how this changed my thinking. I think that that's another great thing that people would love to read as well. Yeah. Claire, I keep writing you write a post on. about, no, no, <laughs> you write a post about changing a, a post and like that's a, it doesn't happen that often that in, unfortunately in today's world that people are willing to change their mind about something. And so, yeah, I think saying like, I thought, and I mentioned before that I was writing, writing a thing, you know, really going hard at, at Kimball the other, a few weeks ago. And I was just like, this isn't valuable. Like sometimes you realize halfway through that your own opinion was wrong. Like it's not someone else telling you that it's not even wrong, but it's not valuable. You just get halfway through and you realize. And I think part of that is like the intent of why you're writing. If you're always approaching your writing from that place of trying to do something valuable as opposed to trying to be a contrarian, the sake of being a contrarian, trying to take down someone else's ideas. Like, yeah, if this happens, it's it's absolutely an, a learning opportunity. I don't think anyone's gonna hold it against you for getting it, maybe not wrong, maybe not right the first time, but I don't think it's really a, a wrong either. So yeah lessons on, uh, on how to be wrong in 2021, I think is a, a hard thing to talk through. <laughs> it also really helps to find editors who you think might disagree with you ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm thinking oh, yeah. of a recent situation on the Locally Optimistic blog where Alan wrote a series of posts on how to run a monthly business review, put the first draft out there. And Michael and I were like, no, data leaders <laughs> do that. That's, just, that's not your job. Don't encourage yeah. people to do that. It's a terrible idea, which is extra hilarious in retrospect now that I'm also the head of path to do that, um, which is fine. But that's it, fine because your title It changed. wasn't my right. data job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but getting that feedback early didn't necessarily make him back down from the idea altogether, but to approach it in a more nuanced way of like, when is this the right thing for you? And there are you know some some roles where you're more operational and this might make sense for you. There's other roles where you should stay far, far away from this extra work being thrown at you. <laughs> but having that like early feedback allowed him to evolve that idea, you know, before it was out in the world versus putting it out there and then, you know, feel, feeling like there's a bigger hurdle to changing your mind, even though really this is a small world. We can we can evolve the locally optimistic thinking pretty easily. <laughs> but I think that's a that's a really good question. Um, we're sort of approaching the end of this. So I'm going to go for a couple sort of later stage questions around, um, given your role as an editor for mm -hmm. other folks work, what are some of the areas that you see common mistakes or paths that you think people shouldn't go down tips you've got kind of based on that perspective. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I got kind of got to play this role like as editor, but also as the person who um, got to choose which talks were at a very popular conference last year and sort of often like what you write about is, is what you speak about as well. Um, and the biggest thing that I saw from newer people actually, and I saw this from like some experienced CEOs as well, which was fascinating to be like on a call with people who are the CEOs of very, not, no one on this call, don't worry, uh, <laughs> CEOs of, of uh, well-known companies and realize like, oh, they don't actually have that good of a talk here, which is a very strange thing to be part of. Um, but the, sorry, to go, to backtrack a little bit, the, the, the I guess, biggest mistake or biggest thing that uh, I, I see newer people tend to do is write articles about a solution. Like the thing that they're writing about is a solution and they forget to talk about a problem. Um, someone on this call, I don't know if I should name names, but there's someone on this call who, actually I'm just gonna have to do it, who does, who does the exact right version of this. Um, Brittany's on this call. If you go to her blog, her blog uh, site, she wrote an article recently about like how to automate really hard things and like to and sorry like how to automate 
uh, process and impress your organizers along the way. There we go, she's got the link to it going. Um, and the reason I loved that article was because there was a storyline. There was like, we did this thing, it kind of sucked. It was really hard. We wasted, all, like we spent a lot of time doing it. We made this thing better. And now like we have, uh, you know, it's, it's made our lives better for all of these things. Now, the thing that they did to make that better was they wrote a macro, like an article DBT macro. And a lot of junior writers would instead write an article, which is like, here's how to write a macro to do this very specific thing. And they're writing about the solution instead of the problem and the value of the problem. And so the thing that I'm always going back to people is like, what is the business problem this solves? And how did you get close to it? And maybe even like, sometimes it's okay to say, we thought this was gonna be a valuable thing and it turned out it wasn't, but we learned something else along the way. And so that can be a really valuable perspective in an article as well. Um, instead, like you know, I have articles come across my desk, which is like, here's how we you know, deploy our DBT project without using DBT cloud. And it's like a list of 10 different tools they use. And it's, uh, if there's a, a, a tech stack diagram involved, I usually don't wanna be involved with it. Cause it's just like, here's this cool thing I built. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, <laughs> I want to know like how you actually materially impacted the business, the nonprofit, like other people in your organization, how you made their lives better. So that is my, my number one tip is like, what is the business problem that you are solving and how did you solve it or not solve it? Really, really um, valuable framing. Um, the other thing is like weaving in that narrative. Um, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. If you need to simplify how things happened so that people can understand the problem you're solving, simplify away. Um, I once gave a talk, which was like, how to be a more impactful data analyst. I outlined five different stages of my learning. Those things didn't happen in order, but they made for a great story. Like we're gonna go for that one. You gotta like do the, the strongest narrative. We are human beings. We want to hear stories. That's like, it's just so in our nature. Um, the other, other thing I wrote down here was that, you know, getting feedback too late in the process, um, that just is really, really hard to, uh, to correct someone on that. I've like personally spent hours drafting an email telling someone that their article wasn't good enough to go on a, the blog and I felt awful, but if we just had a conversation, cause I'd spent like probably 20 hours worth of work on this post at this point, I felt really bad about it but we could have avoided the whole thing um and finally the other thing that really bugs me is when um people don't have a clear personal voice um there's companies who you know they've got their brand voice and they expect everyone to write in that brand voice and they're very formal and stilted and you know things like that so um making sure that you are writing as yourself you're representing yourself even if you are part of a company you are still your own voice the one article I actually regret the most was one that was ghost written for me. Um, and I got to edit it and it was based on a presentation that I gave, but someone else actually did the writing and I regret not protecting my own voice there. Um, and every single time someone shares it, I like a little part of me is upset. Um, so developing your voice and, and I guess protecting it in a way as well so that, um, you know, it's, it's all consistent. Those are, uh, those are all the things that I, I see as, like if those things aren't in a post, it's very hard for me to work with someone to make it better. If instead I get a post that has a great narrative, we just need to move things around a little bit. We just need to tighten up a few sentences. We need some better headings. That, like I'm terrible at introductions. Um, I'm terrible at conclusions, but a great editor can do those for you if you've got the structure in there or they can help you out with them. Um, that's like that art, that draft article is is much much easier for me to work with um yeah that was a lot <laughs> it was great and i'm gonna round out with the hard question coming from barry mm. building off of that what are the biggest areas you want to improve in your own writing and how are yeah. you approaching it yeah um Great question, Barry. Uh, we were looking, we, I wrote an article recently that Barry gave me some feedback on, which was extremely valuable. I left the article up, um, but I, I think I might rewrite it based on that feedback. And uh, the, so, uh, so yeah, just big thanks to Barry there. Um, 
the area that I want to work on in my own writing is moving beyond uh, like di directly useful things, like moving on to, to bigger ideas. I'm someone that feels extremely comfortable in terms of writing how-to guides, why-to guides, <laughs> uh, why guides, um, you know, uh, doing teaching lessons. That's, that's my job now, um, pairing on things. Uh, and I, I really love that category of things because it is, I feel like it is immediately valuable to people, but I feel uncomfortable as soon as I, you know, go out of that zone and I'm trying to do sort of the writing that's happening at the moment. Like, you know, the stuff that Ben Spansel writes, I look at that and I'm like, I don't know how to do that. Um, and so I think if there was one area that I wanted to focus on, it would be feeling com confident enough to do that kind of writing. Um, so then I can choose whether I want to do that writing. That doesn't mean that I want to like always be writing those kinds of posts. Actually, I really, really like the stuff that I get to write today. Um, but I would love to develop that as like an extra, you know, can we say arrow in my quiver? Is that a, still a PC phrase? Like an extra thing that I have tool in my tool in my toolbox to have at my disposal. Um, so yeah, that's uh, so what I'd work on next. So do we get to look forward to Claire's hot takes on the industry in the near future? Uh, uh, I'm a little busy. <laughs> um, maybe, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. I'll let the ideas wait, uh, uh, percolate a little longer and, um, and I'll get back to it. And not for too okay. long because you got to put them out in the world. Yeah, right. I know, not for too long, but also if you've got writer's block, step away from it and all these different conflicting things that I've said. Yeah. <laughs> it's an art. It's an art, not a science. Uh, awesome. Well, we are just about at time. Thank you so much, Claire. This has been awesome. And thank you to everyone who's here. The chat and questions have been top notch. Excellent audience engagement. Excellent. Um, knowledge sharing from Claire. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Caitlin. Um, I'm going to throw some notes in um, and you can see an example of a shaped article because I wrote some notes for this and this is kind of where I would normally share things. So I'll share that in uh, the Slack channel in just a moment. Amazing. Cool. Uh, awesome. I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks for coming.